How is everyone doing? Did you guys have a good weekend? Yeah? Okay. Uh, let's talk about a little bit of organization. Remember that there is no laboratory this week, but there is going to be a laboratory next week related to wellbore stability. So uh, the week of November the, the 4th, then remember Monday, Thursday, depending on your day, uh, you should uh, come to the laboratory downstairs, okay? Remember to bring uh, long pants and close toe shoes, otherwise you're not going to be allowed to be in the lab. Last time I was a little bit lenient with that, but I'm gonna tell the TA now to be uh, very strict about this policy. All right, so today we're going to finish with faults and fractures. And we have been talking about faults and we have applied something of what we have learned so far about stresses, stresses in three dimensions, stresses on a plane, in order to understand when a fault or a fracture is close to failure in shear. And in order to put a little bit more of reality to this, we talk about mapping of faults, either through seismic or through wellbore imaging. And to that, we added the typical orientation variables that we use for faults and fractures, which are strike and dip, these two. And we talked about what would be the ideal orientation of a fault to form or the most likely one to reactivate if you already had some faults. <coughs> so these two things are very important and we saw these diagrams about how to understand that. Again, remember that for the exam, I'm gonna allow you to have these cards. If you need some cards, stop at my office. I, I have a bunch of them or you can make them on your own, but they're going to be very useful in order to understand how these faults are in in three dimensions. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to visualize this. When you have two planes, you have three dimensions and, and this is not aligned exactly, let's say with the north or, or west east, but it's at some angle. So it, it gets a little bit difficult, but if you have the cards, it's a lot easier. And the same thing for the stereo net and the strike and dip. It's a lot easier with this. There's no way to miss it. All right. And then we learn about the 3D Mohr circle that will allow us to calculate given any orientation of the fault, whether it's an, at an ideal orientation or not to reactivate, we can calculate what is its shear stress and normal effective stress. And we saw a few problems about that. And I think you're working on this one now. And we learn all of this because we want to know what is going to be the role of shear fractures and faults in reservoirs. And, uh, and these are the three applications that we're going to see. The first one is about critically stressed fracture. In a typical problem like this one, what you know is what is, for example, the state of stress and also the directions, you know what is the orientation and dip of faults or fractures. And the question here is, if it is close to reactivation or if it's critical stress or not. So in mathematical terms would be is shear divided effective normal stress equal or larger than the friction coefficient. Remember that this is something that varies in here and the friction coefficient, it's a property, something set, something you already know. So it's a property of the rock. And whenever the state of stress is close to that friction coefficient, we know that those fractures are close to failure, close to reactivation. And sometimes they may be even slowly failing with time. 
And whenever that happens, we may have rocks that have a higher permeability on one direction than in another. For example, for this particular case, the set of fractures in this location is going to have more permeability than a set of fractures in this direction. Let's see an example about this in order to understand how you will drill a horizontal wellbore based on this data. And I'm going to go to the example I usually use. OK, you want to have to apply all what you have learned so far in order to understand this example. Let's see if I can save it over here. OK. Here you have a more circle. Here you have a failure envelope or shear failure. Here you have a stereo net. And here you have the fractures that represent all those points in here. The red color means falls and fractures which are in this location. And in terms of north and south will be fractures which are in this section, in the red part of the stereo net. When see in the stereo net that this is close to red, that means that these are the faults that are going to, are going to be more cl closely to reactivate. So question number one, for extra points, what is the strike of those faults? Please raise your, ha raise your hand if you want to answer so I know. According to this 3D more circle, according to that plot, Mr. Kosri. The strike, 180? Mm, no. Mr. Is Adismail? 90 degrees. So this is a, a fracture which is, is like this like that where let me move this down I'm looking at these ones over here in the red area the normal direction is going here and the dip would be remember the the outer region is 90 degrees so and this is zero so this should be about 60 what kind of faulting regime would that be? Normal, very well. Who said normal? Mr. Dodd, very well. So we have, what this is telling us is that we'll have fractures that are closer to reactivate at a strike of 90 degrees, and those will be normal fractures. Okay. Let's now assume that those fractures that are closely to reactivate and uh, are in this location, they have higher permeability than all of these in some other regions far away from the, this region where this is red, far away from the shear failure. My question now is, and now assuming that those fractures in the red zone are these fractures colored in red, and let's say the ones in in blue or in green are all of those planes colored also in green or blue. So let me zoom in a little bit more. So I don't know if you can see very well in your, uh, on, the, on this screen, but we, what we have here are like, like small planes like this one, colored in red, more or less in this location, and in green in here, and on, in blue somewhere in there. Assuming that the fractures in this direction are the ones that are more hydraulically conductive. And the strike apparently is 90 degrees, so the north should be over there. Okay? 
north, south, east, west. In which direction would you place a horizontal wellbore if you are not doing any hydraulic fracturing, but you want to take advantage of the natural permeability of the reservoir? Let's say this is a tight gas sandstone, very brittle, fractured, and uh, we're not going to, to do hydraulic fracturing, but just put a horizontal wellbore. In which direction would you put it? East, uh, west, north, south, at an angle. Ms. Khalil, you, you were saying something? East, west. Um, you could put it east, west, but I'm not sure that would be the best uh, scenario. North, south. Why? Why north, south? Well, but we're, we're not doing hydraulic fractures in this case. So, but if, if you were to put hydraulic fractures there, you would put it in this direction. Uh, you have uh, an answer? You raise your hand? No? I, I was no, no, but you have to justify your answer. Um, well, it's, well, it's north, south. Okay. So you said north south like this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, ma'am, I think you're close, but uh, yes? Is it north south because the area of the fracture would be greater in north to south? Or is it, so you would hit more of the natural fracture? I think um, bro probably look at this swarm of fractures. You could put also a wellbore over here, right? But the idea is that. Let me tell you this, that you put the wellbore in the direction in which you, with a single wellbore, you hit the largest number of natural fractures that have high permeability. So in this case, you already have some natural fractures that have some permeability, and you don't have to do any <coughs> hydraulic fracturing, so you put it north-south, you will hit a lot of those with a single wellbore. If you were to put the wellbore east-west, uh, probably you will just hit a lot less and it will be a l the permeability in this system is a lot higher in this direction east west anywhere than north south so if you put the wellbore east west still the fluid the fluid has a very hard time going from here let's say from the north to the south or from the south to the north where the wellbore is but if you put the north south anywhere in here it can go very quickly in direction east-west, because that's the direction in which you have your fractures oriented like this. So in this case, you would put it north-south. Did, did you guys follow that? Do you have any question? So the idea here, again, is to put the wellbore in the direction in which you hit the largest number of hydraulically conducting natural fractures, and then you take advantage of that anisotropy of the permeability, which in this case, this particular case, is a lot higher east-west, because this is the direction in which the hydraulically conductive fractures are oriented. Okay, then let's come back over here. And uh, if you were to have a problem like this, again, I will tell you what the stresses are. I will tell you what the orientation of the faults is, and you will have to tell me if this is critical stress or, or, or not. A similar problem related to this is when we have fault or fracture reactivation uh, due to an increase in pore pressure. Sometimes you may not be close to this shear line, but you may be quite close, uh, or you may, you may not be not too far away. So we could have cases in which we have the friction coefficient line over here. If this is one, this will be friction coefficient. And 
we have the state of stress somewhere over here, not quite uh, at failure, but close. Here the question is, how much pore pressure do we need in order to get this to failure? You remember that the higher the confinement, which would be equivalent, this one, to confining pressure in our triaxial test, but in general will be the minimum effective stress. The higher the confinement, the higher the mean stress of the rock, the stronger it gets. Because this shear failure line is further and further away. We can resist a higher difference between sigma 1 and sigma 3. OK. But what happens if you were to inject the fluid and lower the pore pressure? If you keep all total stresses constant, remember that total stress is going to be equal to the effective stress plus pore pressure. If you keep the stress, total stress constant, constant and you increase the pore pressure, what's going to happen to the effective stress? So let me write that. If S is constant and we increase the pore pressure, that means that your effective stress is going to decrease. So for some of these of these places in the subsurface, in the subsurface it gets a little bit more difficult because the boundary conditions are not exactly like this of st constant stress. But we can assume them like that for now. If you have constant stresses and you lower the pore pressure, that means that there is going to be a distance from, from the Morse circle to the failure line for which you could have a reactivation. That means that this Morse circle, if you increase the pore pressure, is going to move to the left. And it's, if it moved to the left, it would hit the shear line. And when that happens, is when we say that we have a fault or a fracture reactivation. The stresses didn't change. What you change is the pore pressure. And because of that, the, the fracture of the fault might get to reactivate. This could be. A, could seem a little bit easier when we just look at the plane of, of a fracture of a fault and we have a given normal stress, total stress, and a given shear. Remember that the normal stress is going to be effective normal plus pore pressure. If this one is constant, and again, we decrease, increase the pore pressure, the effective normal stress is going to decrease. If the effective normal stress decreases, the shear to effective normal stress ratio would increase and it will get close to failure. So here the question is, how much pore pressure do we need in order to reactivate faults? And for now, we're just going to make this quite simplified will just say that the horizontal distance between the closest point of the 3D more circle to the line is going to be that change in pore pressure. That's kind of a conservative estimation. But uh, for some cases, it could work well. So if you know how far your more circle is from your shear line, then uh, you know what is that magnitude of pressure you need in order to reactivate shear fracture. Let me show you an example of application for this. And this example, we're going to go to a small or medium scale example, and we'll, then we'll go to a larger scale example. 
Remember that all of these, we talk in general about faults because it's a little bit easier to conceptualize, but it also is valid for small fractures. And let's see, we are right here. Uh, no, another one. Oh, well, you, we can do this one too. Can anyone tell me what this is? So here we have a horizontal wellbores and a lateral. Look from the from the top, some stereo nets. You, you should get used to look at stereo nets. They are very useful for many things. And we have some dots in there. Anyone knows what those dots are? Uh, what? <coughs> Fractures? Yeah, yeah, indirectly, but, but what, 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 what are they? What? Spontaneous potential, you said? Yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, there is some, the color along the wellbore is, uh, is something, but I don't know with what, but the dots are something else. The dots are the hypocenters or of small earthquakes. The dots mark induce microseismicity during hydraulic fracturing. And this occurs because when you make a fracture, for example, somewhere around here, one, you change the state of stress by making a fracture, but also you're injecting a fluid. And when, when you inject the fluid, you change the pore pressure when the pore pressure increases, effective stresses decrease, and some of these fractures reactivate, fail in shear, and emit energy through elastic waves. You remember when we broke some of our rocks that we heard a loud noise? That's the release of strain energy through sound, and in the subsurface, it happens the same. You don't hear the sound, but you measure the elastic waves that come from the subsurface to the top or to some monitoring wellbore that tells you what is the location of these in three dimensions. So all of those points are micro failure, or not a micro, it depends. The size of the dot tells you how big it is, but those could be fractures that are of the size of one foot to more or less 10 feet, more or less. And it will be larger, it will be m something closer to a fault. But all of those points are, it's shear failure reactivation around a hydraulic fracture. So linking this to what we said before about hydraulic fractures and permeability, about fracture, shear fractures and permeability, do you think this reactivation is good or not for hydraulic fracture? It is because it helps not only to create, uh, you not only have the high permeability of a propped fracture, but some of these are also non-propped. You create additional permeability in the planes in which you may have reactivation. For this one, very likely these are closer to normal faults. So what you will have is this fault should be like this some angle, it's not going to be all precisely like this, but it's gonna be closer like that. You wouldn't have something like this because it's not optimal to reactivate. <laughs> Those would be more or less like that. Okay, so this is on the good side of, of fault or fracture reactivation because you increase permeability. Uh, I recommend you to read my notes here. I have a little more of ex explanation about that. But on some other cases, it may not be beneficial or that's maybe something that, that you want to avoid. In this example, you have micro seismic clouds again, here and there on this plot. Look how aligned they are. And here there was an injector that was injecting uh, almost continuously for some time carbon dioxide, for carbon dioxide storage. 
And what they measured was that after one year of pumping, they saw that some faults were reactivating. Okay, looking at this microseismic cloud, uh, can you tell me what the strike of these reactivated faults is? Yes, sir. Two seventy. Um, can you make it easier? Uh, le less. Like, uh, what two seventy? The north is over there. Okay. This is a place in Illinois. <coughs> How much? Between ninety and one eighty. Um, no, no. I, I want a precise number. Uh, anyone else? Yes. What? 130, uh, 130, uh, let me see, why, why are you seeing 130 over there? I guess, I guess you could say 130 or uh, can you do it in the quadrant notation? Let's say from the north, how many degrees towards the east? Thirty or so, yeah, well, I like that. So, so these are the faults. The strike is this. I'm looking at the how aligned those micro seismic clouds are. So, what this, what that means is that if this is a fault, is that there is something reactivating at the beginning here, and then here, and then over there, and then over here, and all those reactivations they form a cloud that tells you the strike of the fault. So all those dots, they come from different points along the fault, but they align pretty well. So they are telling you there is something there, which is it's not just one point, but it's a cloud of points that is coming from the same place. All right. Uh, one more question. In this place, the state of stress is reversed. Can you tell me what is the orientation of the maximum, horizontal maximum stress? All right, so, so you know what the faults look like, right? The faults are, we, we know the strike. So if, if this is reverse, what would be the direction of the maximum principal stress. Mr. Kosri? 135. 135, yes. something like this, like that, right? So the maximum stress is coming in this direction and it's making those faults reactivate like planes like this. Okay. I expect that you guys, that, that you, you know, learn the, the fundamentals, but you're able to apply this to reality. Like in the exam, I gave you that example of a well log and uh, what is called a stress log, which is an actual case. And you learn how to read that based on the basic concepts that we learn here in class. And, and for this one, it's the same. It's an application example. You, you see what's going on and you, have, you need to be able to relate that uh, a real problem to the fundamental concepts. Okay, let me mark here the extra points. Uh, we'll move on. I thought today we'll, we'll get started with well worth stability, but probably not. But this is very important nonetheless. So the last thing that we're going to use from this analysis is the determination of the limits of stress. So we saw critical stress fractures and permeability, uh, fault and fracture reactivation, sometimes good, sometimes not that much. And this will be determination of the limits of horizontal stress.
Okay. Basically, what we do here is something that we talked a little bit about before, but uh, we will now explain a little bit more in detail. That you sideways, let's say, as we were seeing in that example, with a horizontal stress, there's going to be a maximum stress that you can put on the rock at the limit is going to fail and because of that if this is let's say strain and if this is sigma 1 in this direction and we have sigma 3 in this direction at the beginning when you start pushing sideways let's say with a tectonic strain there is going to be some proportionality. This is where we will use our equations of uh, tectonic stresses in which we say sigma is proportional to some sort of stiffness modulus. The equation is a little bit more complicated, but let's just simplify like that for now. Some stiffness modulus times strain. But the, the main concept is that stress is proportional to strain. And this is that linear segment. But we're going to push forever, and there's going to be a maximum. And that maximum is when the rock breaks. That maximum is when the Mohr circle gets onto the shear line. And this maximum is going to be that sigma 1 is going to be this coefficient q times sigma 3 where q remember is about 3 and it depends on the friction angle with this formula all right so all what we have to do right now is to apply this equation to different types of faulting regimes let's do it for reverse which is the one that we have right here. Okay, so then for reverse faulting, this means that which is going to be sigma 1? So sigma 1, Q, sigma 3, always the same. Sigma 1 in reverse is going to be sigma H max and sigma 3 would be sigma v. And basically what this equation is telling you is that the maximum effective horizontal stress cannot be larger than q times the effective vertical stress. And if you were to, to plot what this is as a function of depth, it will be something like this. If this is depth, and let's say this one is pore pressure, and this one is vertical stress, then that means that your effective vertical stress is going to be the distance between those two lines and your effective horizontal stress should not be more than, let's say, three times that. So, SH max is going to be here. And this is going to be sigma h max cannot be larger than that because if it's larger it, it's going to be a failure and notice that you always have to do this relationship in terms of effective stress because if you have a lower effective stress then also your effective horizontal stress is going to be smaller let me do this in the in the following example 
This is for reverse faulting. Uh, what you know is, remember the vertical stress, the limit is the maximum horizontal stress. Oh, and one more thing, uh, for reverse faulting, if we re relate this to, uh, to a fault, it moves in this direction, and that this is why it is called reverse, because the hanging wall moves opposite gravity. So it's sort of reverse. Uh, for strike slip, now sigma 1 is going to be, well, it's going to be again sigma h max. Sigma 3 is going to be sigma h min. It's not going to be sigma v. And now what is going to be uh, delimited is what is the value of uh, sigma h max as a function of sigma h min. Okay. This technique sometimes is very useful to estimate what is the value of sh max based on sigma h min. But remember that not all, all the times we know sigma h min. We, we know what is uh, sigma v or sv, we know what pore pressure is. Uh, but most times we, we don't know what sigma h min is. But for this example, we're going to assume it. See that this is SV. Let's say that that this is for pressure. And notice that now we have some overpressure. Let's say that that we know what is sh min so uh, what we if we know what is the value of sigma h min oh, i shouldn't have used that color let me use green if i know what the value of sigma h min is then i know that sigma h max cannot be more than three times that. So let's say something like this. And I notice that it's the same thing over here. So this is going to be SH max. But the concept is, is quite simple. The maximum effective stress cannot be larger than the limit at failure uh, based on the minimum effective stress. And in this case, when we look from the top and we have this um let me see okay wrong it should move in the other direction you have a, i have sh max and sh min and it moves like this notice that it moves along the strike and that's what is called strike slip and again the limit is going to be proportional to the effective stress limit of, uh, of the minimum horizontal stress and last i have a case of normal faulting And for normal faulting, the equations, remember, are always the same. And the, remember, this equation is always the same. The things we say about the angles, it's always the same. So we just, you just need to apply it to different stress regimes. And here, the maximum value is going to be sigma v, and this is q 
sigma h mean. But here, what we know most times is sigma v. So actually, our unknown and what we're going to determine is sigma h mean, which is going to be sigma v divided by q. So if we know, uh, let me do sv first. We know vertical total stress. We know pore pressure. Then using this equation that we have here, if this is sigma v, sigma h mean should be about a third of that, assuming q is equal to 3. So it's going to be somewhere over there. Let me do another point somewhere over here. It's going to be somewhere over there. So this is going to be something like this. And this one is sigma h mean. And this one is sigma v. OK, this plot was not great, so let me improve it. So the concept is very simple. You know one of the stresses, then you determine the other based on this general equation. And I think we have a few minutes, so we can do one example. And thi this is basically problem number seven, I believe. Seven, six and seven of the homework. Uh, let's check quickly. Okay, I think I made the homework to be due on Thursday, all right? It is, it's not too difficult. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. And yes, uh, seven and eight. These, these are problems seven and eight that involve this type of uh, uh, problem. So what about, guys, if we try to do Let's try to do eight together, okay? All right, so let's see. Uh, let me move this to the left. Okay, we have a place offshore. So the first thing I'm going to do is to draw an offshore platform. The water and the seafloor. And uh, this is 500 feet. And what else? It's normal faulting. And we have overpressure at 1,500 feet through vertical depth. OK. And at 2,000 feet, we have a lambda p of 0.78 through vertical depth. OK. So 1,000 feet below. Then we have the start of overpressure and 500 feet more. Apparently, we have our problem somewhere around here. And at this location, lambda p is equal to 0.78. We need to calculate the 
total minimum horizontal stress, and we know this is normal faulting. So if this is normal faulting, then very likely these faults somewhere around here are going to look something like this, where if this is the sediment and this is normal fault, this one should be somewhere over here, and it's going to look something like, like this. These are normal faults because they are steep. The dip is about 60, and because the way the hanging wall moves related to the foot wall. Okay, you, you, you don't have to, to see that right away, but you see that later it makes sense. All right, so the first thing that we have to do here is to compute the vertical stress. What is the vertical stress? And uh, there are no gradients in here, so assume typical gradient. Okay, so we'll say we have 500 feet of, of water, so we'll do this like that. To that, I add the part of the rock. And how many feet should I use now in my equation? 1,500, because that's below the, the seafloor. And that's going to give me something. And you're going to calculate it. And then I need pore pressure. I know what the overpressure parameter is. It's 0.78. So this is just going to be simply uh, lambda p times the vertical stress. And I'm going to get something. And after I get that, I'm going to get a sigma v. And after I get my sigma v, I'm going to be able to calculate sigma h mean, but uh, wait a minute, we need to know, okay, friction angle is 30 degrees, okay, so we need to know q first, q is going to be, it's not going to be 3 all the times, okay, so keep no, that in mind, it's going to depend on this equation, and after I get what q is equal to, then sigma h mean, finally, is going to be sigma v divided by q. And after I do that, last thing, sh mean will be sigma h mean, something I just calculated, plus pore pressure. And that's the end of the problem. And problem number seven, it's uh, it's very similar, and there you have a friction coefficient which is uh, which is uh, different, and also probably you you may do that one with Excel, because you have to calculate stresses at several depths and you have to make plots, so that would be a lot easier if you if you do it with with Excel. And problem number eight, it's uh, number nine. It's more of uh, an interpretation example in which you know what is the direction of the, the strike of the faults. You know what that this is normal faulting. And based on that, I want you to tell me in which direction you will put horizontal wells for hydraulic fracturing. And after you think about that, uh, I ask you to tell me if that's whether what you see in reality or not. Okay? All right. So on Wednesday, we'll start talking about wellbore stability. See you guys. <laughs>